Hi there, I'm sure my guest doesn't need any introduction. I know you all know who he is. Hey JP, <laughs> we were trying to look really serious before we came on, on camera. You ruined that, Anita. I know, I but did. Th <laughs> but thank you for having me on, sister. I just love chatting with you, just how we have been off air. So honored that you would invite me onto your show. I am so happy you agreed to do this because you know, I know my audience already knows who you are, but I thought if there's on the off chance, if there's anybody who doesn't know who you are, then they should, because you are just so funny. So if anyone doesn't know who this is, this is JP Sears. And I came across his videos about four years ago because he makes fun of, of everything. And just to assure you, JP, this is a gluten-free video. So you don't have to worry about anything. Well, I, I, I'm still worried. I, I'm worried that this video wasn't made in a facility that's 100% free of all cross-contamination, gluten-containing grains. So I will be worried still, Anita. And I think being worried is part of how you have a good life. Oh, Gives absolutely. you a sense of control. Yeah, you need to worry. That is exactly how we have a good life. But the thing is, the other thing we have to be worried about is, are we spiritual enough? I mean, I know you're ultra spiritual, but I don't know about me. I, I mean, I try. I, I brought my bowl, so. That, wow, that's like a, a Pavlov's dog enlightened effect that goes off in my mind anytime I hear a bowl dung. <laughs> dung. dung. I don't know if that's actually English or if it's just how you describe bat poop, but nonetheless, <laughs> I think it's obvious by the way you're dressed that you're ultra spiritual, Anita, and and I think truly, you know, the the real judge of spirituality, it comes down to how is a person dressed. So I think you play the part well. So tonight, maybe I'm more spiritual than you. Maybe? I think it's it's definitely okay for you to think that, yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the things that I that I really love is well, first of all, just for the audience, um, you, I don't know if you all know this, but JP is actually a coach and does really help people in a profound way. And my interpretation of your humor is that. Um, is that you know like everything in this world everything's got a shadow side and as much yeah. as we love spirituality even spirituality has a shadow side and what you do jp is that you shine a light on the shadow side and you do it with your humor and that's what i love yeah well th thank you for seeing that anita that is absolutely a very clear intention of my work and i think you see clearly for you to be able to see that and yeah, you know, the the reason why I started making my ultra spiritual videos was to shine the light on my own shadow that was coming out in my spiritual life, which was, you know, said another way, I started to notice all my ego's agendas and my egotisticalness in my spiritual life. Funny thing about the ego and you know, all the shadowy stuff that it, at least I carry. I'm sure I'm the only person on earth that does this. <laughs> My ego likes to hide its agendas behind noble looking hiding spots like spirituality, health, and being a good person because those, those noble looking hiding spots, the ego says, who would think to ever look behind that? It just looks noble and glorious. So it's almost like a, a, an invisible hiding spot. Yet I started to realize like, wow, yeah, my spirituality is doing amazing things for me. And simultaneously, my ego's got a very pervasive agenda in my spirituality. So that was going on simultaneously. So it became time for me to, to just really work with that directly. That's so interesting because what's really interesting is that you worked with it using humor. I mean, was that yeah. de deliberate? I mean, because you, you shared it with, with an audience, you created videos about yeah. it. How did yeah, you it, transition it, it, to that? I, I would say it's deliberate, you know, humor, it's a very authentic mode of being in my repertoire of self. I've just always 
been funny ever since I was a little kid. And in part, that's how I dealt with pain. And, and I look at humor as an alchemist. You know, we, we can look at our shadowy stuff and we can deal with it through compassion, yeah. understanding. We can deal with it through action, vulnerability, whatever, journal, ecstatic dance about it. Yet humor is authentic to me. And I consider humor, humor to be quite an alchemist where we can infuse humor into a territory where we're stuck my egotistical agendas and that creates a transformation i think humor really is an energy that can transform yes. and it's a powerful energy and i think any powerful energy it has the power for help or hurt and, and you know we all know that humor can be used to hurt people making fun of them belittling them shaming sarcasm. them yeah. sarcasm in you know, sarcasm to me that comes from scarcasm our old pain that's being projected outward so you know with intentional humor uh, based on my delusional opinion the humor has been a very helpful alchemist and catalyst for my healing, my transformation. And it, it seems like through the videos that are really self-therapy for me, the videos have hopefully been a help to some other people too, to help them see their shadow and help hopefully alchemize their shadow into levity. Oh, I know your videos have been helpful for a lot of people, a lot of people, because um, everybody I've mentioned you too has heard of you so i know you've been helpful to a lot of people you were helpful to me um and i just want to share with the um with the audience a little bit about what uh, what we were talking about before we went on air um and also i would love for you to um, to write your questions in on the comments questions for jp questions for me any questions at all so uh, I, I should write questions for <laughs> jp anita is that what Oh, of course. Didn't you know? Didn't you get the memo? <laughs> yeah. I, I just got needy. I needed your attention. You started talking to the audience. So let me bring it back on me. But yeah, looking forward to everybody's questions tonight. Yeah, and, and nothing is off limits. So ask whatever you like. <laughs> Not you, JP. You can't ask me whatever you like. Everyone else can. No, everybody can. But um, what was interesting is what we were talking about before we went on air. Um, and we're getting a lot of great comments, by the way, from people saying humor is a great way for us to see our dark side. Exactly. Most of what, and this is from Elaine Erskine. You can even punch it up if you like. Um, most of what JP talks about, I see it inside myself. He brings my awareness to my ego. Elaine, this is exactly what we were talking about just before. Um, so many of you know my story that I used to, I, I had cancer, which was supposed to be terminal. Now, before I had the cancer, I was that person who your videos, who are in your videos, that ultra spiritual person who's, um, who's paranoid about gluten and about their food and about spirituality. That was me. That was me. And so when I watch that video, I think, oh my God, this is so great because you have brought humor into how heavily we take life. And for me, it didn't just take cancer because even when I had cancer, I became even more serious. I became even more careful about what I ate and more paranoid. It took death for me to actually realize it. Like literally uh, yeah. being in a coma, being on the brink of death, that's when it was like, oh, I get it now. I get it now. It's like I'm at the end of my life and I get it. Life wasn't supposed to be that serious. Yeah. And, and I love your story, Anita. And, and I think there's a little bit of a, it's almost confusing to my mind, but in a beautiful way where life doesn't need to be so serious because it is very important. One of my favorite quotes, uh, a guy named Oscar Wilde, I've never read any of his stuff other than a few obscure quotes, but I love his quotes. And one of his quotes says, life is too important to take seriously. So I, I think some of us fall into the trap of 
the things that are most important to us, we take the most seriously. Yeah. But I, I think seriousness is actually a fear-based consciousness. I think it's a consciousness of constriction, control. It all comes from fear. So we get really serious about the things that are important to us. In other words, we're afraid of losing them. That's why we get afraid of them. And that fear is you know, expressed through the fear synonym of seriousness. But then there's Oscar Wilde who suggests maybe the things that are most important to you deserve to be worked with so you can get to a point where you don't have to take them seriously, where you can be in a relationship of not fear-based seriousness with the important things, but maybe love-based acceptance, maybe love-based play, God forbid. I, and that's tough because we, we look at the things that are most important to us, our lives, for example. I mean, life, that's something a lot of us take seriously. Our business, our relationships, and you know, kids, like we take all these things so seriously. But I think the real work, and you know, easier said than done, but it's a beautiful call to adventure in the hero's journey of our own lives is to look at what we take most seriously and do our best to drop the seriousness, increase the love. And we can do that through laughter. We can do that through amusement. And a, a piece of homework, a challenge I love to give people is ask them, what do you take most seriously? And now your homework is to go amuse yourself with that. Do your best to even laugh if you can. And, and that's tough. I mean, when we answer, what, did, what do I take most seriously? Now, how can I amuse myself with that? How can I even laugh at, at that? But I think that puts us in a much more respectful relationship with the things that are most important to us. A lot of us have been in a relationship with someone in the past, maybe present, who tries to control us. And a lot of us, we can like pretend like, yeah, I've never tried to control anybody. Yeah, right. So let's blame it on other people. We've all been in a relationship where someone's tried to control us. So we have the experience that it doesn't feel respectful when someone's trying to control us. It, it just doesn't. So I think we can apply that to what, what and who do we take most seriously, including ourselves, and realize like, wow, it feels disrespectful when someone tries to control me. So let me realize I am disrespecting what I try to control, whether or what I take so seriously, because that's a form of control, whether it's myself, my life, other ones. But then on the other end of that spectrum, it's not seriousness and control, but I would dare say surrender, acceptance, real connection, playfulness, even love. Those are very respectful energies that I think can really enhance our relationship with the things and the people that we uh, hold with the most importance in our life. Well, and uh, Anita, I'm not sure if you can still hear me. I, I can't hear you for some reason. I don't know if I got so handsome that it cut the sound off. Does my handsomeness do that? Let me call my wife and see if my handsomeness is getting lethal. <laughs> um, it, it, can you hear me okay, Anita? Oh. I, I'm doing my best to lip reading and I'm going to do lip reading and I, I'm going to try to interpret what you just said, Anita. Now. Okay. I, I hear you now. Okay. Danny's just given me his microphone. So I will put this on. Give me a moment. I will sure. put this big gubsy, ugly head thing on. There we go. It, can what you I me? love. I can. What I love about this, Anita, is to me, it's the, the serendipity of what we we're just talking about. You know, we're on your show, something I know is very near and dear and important to you. And it's like whatever audio gods, I think Zeus controls technical audio and the Greek mythology. You know, there's a screw up. It's like, yeah, it's OK. It's like maybe even better this way because it's maybe just life urging us like, yeah, don't don't take things seriously. 
even if audio gets a little messed up on a show. Well, now, and it happened again. Now I'm about to get serious, Anita. I'm sorry, the, the audio cut out again. It cut out again. And can now you I hear, hear you? Now it's working. Okay, Danny says it's working. You can hear me again? I can hear you again. <laughs> you know what? I'm, okay. I'll shut up. So I have to tell you something. It's Wayne Dyer's death anniversary today. And oh, I wow. think he's messing with us. This is just the kind of thing he would do. To, wow. You know, he would, Wayne, um, Wayne Dyer. Wayne, you, you beautiful, sadistic human in spirit form, you. Thank you for teaching us to... Not take it all so seriously. Yeah, don't get serious. That's what he's trying to tell us. Stop taking yourself so seriously. You think the show is so professional and like, here, let me show you how vulnerable you are. That is exactly it, it, the kind of thing he'd do. Exactly. And actually, Wayne just came over and deep pantsed me. So now I'm doing the show without my shorts on, which is... <laughs> So maybe it's, 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 it's liberating. I'll, I'll be honest. I won't so you stand don't up. Want to stand. I was just going to say, so I guess you don't want to stand up. <laughs> I, I don't want your Facebook account to be shut down. Oh gosh. Yeah. I would, I would very so Facebook that and Instagram, <laughs> but, but you know, you said something very, very interesting. You said, take, uh, you, you said the homework was to find what you were most serious about and then play with it, turn it into something fun, make fun of it. Yeah. And that's more profound than you think, because like, for example, um, people have, let's say if, you, if you're really willing to be honest with yourself, not you personally, but people generally, if we're willing to be really honest with ourselves and find our darkest shadows, like maybe we have a fear of abandonment or something yeah. like that. Imagine if you can turn it into humor and actually make jokes about it. It really, there's instant healing and instant light that's yeah. poured onto something really dark, which when we leave it as an issue, when we leave it as something we're serious about, it becomes a, a button. It, it causes us to be defensive when people talk about it. But if yeah. we can talk about it ourselves with humor, and Danny and I have started, we do that with each other all the time. And, you know, we, I'm trying to think of an example and I can't offhand. But, you know, we, we really do do that all the time yeah. uh, where we just bring things up ourselves and, and just play with it and say, you know, and, 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 and say something humorous about the darkest part of ourselves. And then we laugh about it. Yeah, it, you know, I, I think it really is a practice of non-attachment. Not going there because we're afraid of it, we stay really attached. But when we can add the the sort of humor to help slice through the psychological scar tissue of our psyche, whether it's old pain just embedded in there, or it's, you know, our imagination, the shadow side of it starts running rampant. So we take our fear, we imagine worst case scenario, but we can use a sort of humor to come to slice through that and deflate some of the shadow, whether it's old pain that's needing to be released or otherwise. And, you know, I, I got married three, uh, three months ago and was it three months ago? Yeah. Oh, three congratulations. Ago. Thank you. And, you know, I, to be honest, I have a fear of I'll lose my wife one day. Whether, you know, whether it's through death or, you know, my, my old wounds of I'm not enough, like those get active and think like, well, I'll, I'll just not be enough. And of course she'll leave me. So, and, and as like real and, and, scary and sometimes painful all of that and the you know the underlying issues of all that is it too deserves to be worked with with humor just like you pointed out so yeah. I, I i might say to my wife in the morning like oh wow i'm surprised you didn't leave me in the middle of the night and you know she knows i'm i'm kidding around but it's actually a way of not just having fun with her and i together but it's also a way of like tickling loose this like tight grip of fear control of like, Oh yeah, I am afraid she'll leave me, but I can make a joke about that. Not in a way to belittle myself or belittle her, but to actually have fun and like feel some of the pain and like start digesting that. 
that's what's really interesting is Danny and I do something very, very similar because um, I, I think that, you know, like I, I feel that after facing death, there's not much that I fear. But the one thing that I do fear is losing Danny. And, sure. and interestingly, I, I don't, um, I, you know, I don't know if this sounds arrogant or sure of myself or whatever, but I don't think he would leave me. I don't, I, I don't think he would leave me. But my fear is if he were to go, if he were to die before me. Now, yeah. I know that there's nothing to fear in death. My fear is being here, le left here without him. That's, yeah. that's the fear. So, um, of course. And, and so that is my, probably my only fear. And so sometimes when, like, I think recently he, he hurt his back really, really badly. And he was in such pain and he was in bed and he couldn't move. And I'd never seen him like this. And I got so scared. I actually got really scared. But he turned it into a joke. And then so did I. And then it just became this real joke where he would say, he would say to me um, that, that yeah, if you just if you just put the rat poison in my coffee now, we can make this easier, and and then you'll be done with me, and then you can get on with your life. And so, and then we were we ended up laughing and laughing, not to make it sound so dark, but we yeah. had to do that. <clears throat> so then, so then you don't feel that fear anymore. Yeah, yeah, I I love that. And one of my one of my greatest fears is box jellyfish in Australia. Those, those suckers, they're like the size of your thumbnail. You can't see them, but they will just kill the life out of you like that. So I'm going to keep taking those things pretty seriously. And spiders. Just, oh, my God. I, I'm scared of spiders and snakes. <laughs> but, and I, go ahead. I saw a poisonous snake in our backyard uh, a few weeks ago, and that was definitely scary. And I noticed anytime I look in the backyard, you know, there might be sticks laying on the ground, but all I see is snakes. It's just a weird trick I play on myself. And, and like, I, I love how you're bringing all this up because now that I mention it, like, you know, playing with the fear, you know, when I saw the snake in the backyard, I text my assistant, you know, I took a picture of it from a safe distance. Don't do selfies with deadly creatures, ladies and gentlemen. So I took a picture of it and, you know, text my, uh, my uh, lovely assistant, Karen, and said, um, uh, if I'm dead by the morning, this is what got me. <laughs> Wow. And I, I'll also throw this out there, Anita, and I'd love to hear what you think about it, it because I, I love your sense of humor. You are just a, you are a child dressed up in an adult body. And I mean that in the best sense of the term, not because you're immature. I think because you're very mature. I think playfulness is the true marker of maturity. Not knowing how to play, I think, is the illusion of being growing up but we're really stuck in immaturity when we don't know how to be playful. So I love your childlike nature and your sense of humor. So on with my question, I, I find that like anything, there's a shadow to humor. I talked about how we can use it to help or use it to hurt. But I also think with pain, we can use it to process pain, like we've been talking about, or we can use it to avoid pain. So, you know, making a joke to deflect from intimacy, making a joke to, you know, yes. get away from the fear rather than using a, a joke to propel you into the dark forest of the fear so you can go beyond it. So it's like, am I using humor to bypass the issue or am I using humor to go into the issue? So I, I'm curious if you ever noticed yourself past, present, or future, depending on how intuitive you are right now, uh, using humor for the shadow side to actually avoid intimacy. Wow, that is a really good point. And do you know, even though I am aware that everything in this world has a shadow side, I never thought of it for humor. I just never thought of that. And that is a really interesting observation. I'm going to have to look at that now and be aware. Do I ever use humor to avoid 
facing something. That's really powerful. See, so you, you, you got me there. I like that. Yeah. It, it, I think it, it's a, a great consideration. And I bring that up not to dissuade you or I or any of the wonderful people watching, not to dissuade anybody from having fun expressing humor. The last thing I'd want anybody to do is to constrict the sphincter of your consciousness and say, well, I was going to say something, but maybe that was going to be like deflective humor. No, like let it out. Yeah. And just notice, notice it. Like when in doubt, let it out. Hundred percent. It's and if you do that, sometimes you'll notice in hindsight, like, well, okay, I think I was really deflecting from a, an emotional connection there. Or I was really deflecting from intimacy, or you know, there was this this vulnerable thing happening, which you know made my ego scared. So I used humor to hit the eject button. I, I, a wonderful mentor of mine, I believe it was about 10 years ago at this point, he, he really called me out in a way that was so uncomfortable in the moment, yet so beneficial to me. Because I, when I would take classes with him, of course, like on the breaks and little you know, uh, uh, comments during class, I, I'd be making jokes. And, and he really appreciates that. And he could also see that I would use humor against myself as well. So, you know, there were times where he, he would call me out and say, JP, are you aware of how you're using humor for deflection right now? And I said, damn it, I wasn't aware of it. And I wish I wasn't aware right now after you said that. <laughs> but it, it was so beneficial. And I'm just going to talk about myself for like forever. I'm just narcissistic. <laughs> But here's what that it. here's what that uncomfortable realization did for me. It allowed me to become more conscious to channel my humor kind of like into laser coherence where just a much higher percentage of it could go into the helping direction. Let's use humor in in the healing liberation direction rather than the deflection and avoidance direction. When I was unaware you know, I was pro pro yeah. probably bleeding it out all over the place. But now it's like, I, I don't know the numbers. I mean, maybe 80% of the time I may be able to be pretty laser focused with my humor energy into the helping direction, which I think is has been the, a catalyst for in the past four years or so, my humor coming out publicly and um, uh uh, being something that a lot of people can connect to. It's just hopefully lasered in a coherent, helpful direction. It certainly has been. and uh, But it's um, it, what you've brought up is a really, really interesting point because now I'm going to become aware, not in a bad way, not like, <gasps> I better not do that, but but more like self-discovery. It's like, do I use humor? And that's, and I don't see it as a bad thing, but it's certainly something to be aware of. Yeah. Because, yeah. So do you still notice or do you not do that anymore? Deflect with humor if you notice something coming up for you? Yeah, I would definitely love to pretend that I never do that anymore. So Anita, I never do that anymore. No, absolutely I, not. <laughs> no, I, I, I do. A hundred percent I do, but I think it's just, I do it less and less frequently and not as much when I do do it, certainly still screw up and stumble. And I think humor is easy for me. It feels safe for me. And I feel a sense of value with humor. Uh, and, I, and I notice in the realms that are, scarier for me yeah. where I feel more like a rookie call it the realm of just pure emotional vulnerability. I find sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll be doing humor and I'll realize this is a time to be vulnerable or I'll, I'll know I need to be vulnerable, but I'm like, screw it. Like this is uncomfortable. Let's make a joke. You know, let's say what I re my heart really needs to say with vulnerability. Let me say it with a joke, and uh, and I'm doing my best to, um, yeah, be aware when I do it, learn from it, 
and do my best to challenge myself into the the scarier realms when I'm called for it. I mean, what, when my wife and I, when, if we're having a tender moment, that's probably not the time to make a joke, but it's really <laughs> comfortable. For, it's probably the time to be connected and just vulnerable. See, the thing is, um, what's really interesting in what you said is that it's an old pattern that you have. Yeah. Your humor is your old pattern and it's comfortable to fall into that pattern even in an inopportune moment you find this comfort in it when you're feeling vulnerable, when you're feeling scared, you deflect it yeah. by falling back into that pattern. Now, in my case, as you were speaking, I realized my old pattern, I was always somebody who was a people pleaser. I've always mm. been non-confrontational. I'd always been a doormat. Um, I've always been someone who was very fearful up to the point when I got cancer. And, um, and I learned when I was facing death, it was like, oh, this is no way to live. If I'm, you know, when I realized I was going to heal, I was uh, uh -huh. getting another chance at life, I realized that's not how I want to live my life. And once you've kind of faced death and faced terminal cancer and come out of it, there's very little that scares you. But yeah. what I found is that even though I know that I no longer, that it doesn't, I know it doesn't serve me to be a people pleaser and to be non-confrontational and to be a doormat. It doesn't serve me. But those old patterns still come up every now and then. And yeah. sometimes when I don't know how to react and I don't know how to deal with a situation and the pattern comes up and I know it's not the right thing to do, just like you know this is not the time to inject humor. But you doing it with conscious, with the consciousness of knowing that this is not the right thing to do, but this is comfortable for me. That's how yeah. it is for me. I know, okay, I shouldn't be in people pleaser mode right now, but it's comfortable for me to do that. The old me yeah. wouldn't even have been aware that, it, you know, I, it would have been unconscious that I was a people pleaser, just like the old you would have been unconsciously making a joke out of everything, even where it was inappropriate. I think there's so much wisdom to that about essentially what I heard you say is if you're going to lose yourself, just know you lost yourself. That way it's easier and quicker to find yourself. Worst case scenario is you'll lose yourself and you didn't know you lost yourself. So you, you would lose yourself to people pleasing. I would lose myself to, you know, humor at, at, in, you know, kind of the shadow side of humor. And I also, like, I, I guess I lose myself in multiple places. I can definitely relate to the people-pleasing pattern. And I'm curious, it, that's something I, I'm continually working on on an ongoing basis. I think much better than I was, you know, when it comes to succumbing to the temptation of, let me comfort myself by pleasing this person, even that if that's at the expense of resenting the hell out of myself, because that's not really a yes for me. My, I don't have the capacity, but yeah, I'll do that. I'll prostitute myself. I've done that. And I need a lot more work. So I'm curious, and I'm guessing only about 100% of other people out there can relate to people pleasing. And, you know, whether it's your dominant pathology or if it's just one of your pathologies. So I'm curious, Anita, it, it, if you had a, a tip or two when it comes to not being a slave to the people-pleasing pattern, what would a tip or two be if you hypothetically had a redheaded friend who was also a people-pleaser in recovery? I would say um, in, in when you're in that situation, reverse it in your mind that's this is what i do anyway and it seems to work for me is that if i'm about to say yes to somebody when i want to say no but i'm saying it out of obligation or because um i don't want to confront them or whatever reasons then i kind of think okay what if that person or somebody they were only saying yes to me because they were afraid to say no to me how would i feel if i found that out I would wish they had said no. I would I would feel yeah. even worse. I would feel guilty that they did it because they were afraid of me or afraid to say no. Yeah. So in a way, uh, then then I kind of tell myself, 
um, I'm undermining them. I'm, I'm kind of assuming that they're not going to be able to handle a no. Who am I to say that about them? <laughs> you know, so, so once I have that little dialogue, it, it changes it for me. That is brilliant. The, and I, I, that second part I can relate to about like the people pleaser says like, oh, they're not strong enough to handle a no from me. They're too fragile, which is so dysfunctional. Like, of course, they're a strong enough person. Maybe they get upset. But even if they do, they're strong enough to handle that is their stuff. But the, the part of that, that's just, it's like a slap across my face in a spiritually violent kind of way is your role reversal uh, mindset. That is brilliant. Because what, uh, what I connected to when you were mentioning that is, yeah, if someone were to like, whatever, take a meeting with me because they felt obligated. Yeah, I would feel terrible. I, yeah. I would actually feel like them doing it out of obligation was in a way like a disservice to me, almost disrespectful. It's, it's an insult to you, sort of. Yeah, it, it is an insult. And then we realize oh yeah all the fingers are pointing at me i do that to how that selfish is it of me to be a people pleaser like wow what crappy energy we and give people when we're people pleasing exactly awesome. i mean imagine if you one day realized that all these things that people were doing for you they're like doing it because they can't say no because they're trying to please you. You'll be like, oh, that's awful. I, I, it just feels icky. Yeah. So it does. Yeah. 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 So, so that's what I tell myself. Um, so that I love that too. Well, thank you for sharing that with me and anyone else out there who's playfully dysfunctional enough to need to hear that wisdom. We're all dysfunctional and delusional as well. Yeah, we'd be boring as hell if we weren't dysfunctional. I, it, maybe that's just me rationalizing my dysfunction. But, you know, I think dysfunction when it's, you know, you, you kind of get the handle on that wave. It's It just makes life more exciting. You know, it, it's like surfing a wave. You know, when, when you know how to be on the board, the, the wave, like, that's fun. But if you don't know how to be on the board, then the wave can drown you. We can drown from our dysfunctions, no question about it. Yet I think when we start to not take ourselves so seriously, we start to do you know, some real committed inner work. Now our dysfunction actually becomes a wave that's not going to drown us, but a wave we can play in. Yeah. Actually, there's something in there that you said that that caught me was when you said when we stop taking ourselves seriously we can do some inner work yeah. I, and w what's really interesting is that means when we take ourselves too seriously we don't do the inner work because it's too painful because we take ourselves too seriously and yeah. it's just too scary and painful to do any inner work and so really yeah for us to be um, to have awareness of who we are, how we are, uh, how we are manifesting ourselves in the world and how we are moving in this world um, and to, to be conscious of it, we do have to take ourselves lightly to be able to do that. Yeah. It, yeah, if we have, have enough grace in our lives to finally come to that, it's just a, a beautiful spot for sure. Um, we've had some great comments. I'm going to ask Danny to push some up onto the screen so you can see them and so our audience can see them. The audience love you. And somebody said they love my shirt. Thank you. <laughs> no one said see, they love your shirt yet. I feel, I feel jealous of your shirt, Anita. I feel like it's definitely the spiritual clothing trump card of this get-together. I thought I'd rock up like I'm wearing purple. Of course, I'm going to you know, be winning the spiritual gold medal of the conversation. But I think fashion wise, you're, you're one upping me here, sister. <laughs> it was deliberate. Orange is the spiritual <laughs> color of the night. Orange. Wow. It's a, I didn't know you were so unevolved that you would think it's not purple. I'm not as, I'm not as evolved as you yet. <laughs> you're ultra spiritual. I'm, 
what am I? Ultra regular. Danny's put in case any people haven't noticed. He's put these beautiful name banners for us, and um, I'm the ultra regular person. Yep. <laughs> ultra regular. That's like saying you excel at being normal. <laughs> Actually, that's not good, is it? <laughs> I think normal is the worst and most pervasive disease in, in the human race. It sure is. Um, oh, good. Mormon Tourette's has said that we're used to the purple shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Tracy Smith has said, purple is working for you. And then she says, I'm wearing orange too, Anita. Yay, Tracy. So one more for the orange. <laughs> so we've got like, yeah, okay. It's orange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we got lots of love going, and if if we if I had emojis to flash on the on the screen, I would flash up my emojis. People are loving you, JP. But oh, you, you right already on. knew that. So I want to ask you a question about your book. You have a book called "How to Be Ultra Spiritual: Twelve and a Half Steps to Spiritual Superiority." So twelve and a half steps. So what happened to the other half of that last step? It wasn't necessary. Oh. You know, it's just like if if you're going somewhere and it's 12 and a half miles away, you're not going to drive 13 miles. It's going to take you past the destination. So 12 and a half steps was the exact amount of steps that necessary was needed to achieve spiritual superiority. <laughs> yeah. You know, I with that book, Anita, I just have to say I had fun with every aspect of it. Everything from even the title, like just pattern interrupting, like 12 and a half steps, like things like that. And then all the endorsements for the book on the back cover, I just made them up. Like, you know, I gave myself a Buddha quote, you know, the, the universe gave me a quote for the book. It's all on the back cover. And, you know, the Buddha doesn't have very adamant copyright attorneys, so you can say anything you want. Oh, this say is that cool. Buddha's. And the, actually the only legit, quote that we put on the back of the book uh, or endorsement on the back of the book was uh, from Tony Robbins, who's, you know, just an amazing person. And, you know, how could you not have, uh, you know, an endorsement from him if he gives you one? So, but yeah, just everything about that book was just a playful adventure because I hit that's, you know, I had never written a book before. It was a playful adventure into unknown territory, you know, scary at times because it's like, Oh, I'm, writing a book i never i've never done that can i do that will it be any good and so it, it was such a joy to write and it was actually because it was such a joy to write when i finished it i went through a grieving process wow like i remember the the relationship i was in at the time you know that the day i finished you know the first draft of the book which is really what felt like the that's the real finish line. Of course, there's rounds of editing and let it work still. But when I finished the first draft of the book, you know, it was, you know, it was just an elation. And the the woman I was in a relationship at the time, she said, Well, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm so happy, but I'm getting sad. Like I thought I would just be only happy. But it was almost just like, okay, the achievement's bringing happiness, but the achievement of finishing it's also bringing the sadness because the journey, the process of writing the book was taking me into such amazing, joyful, adventurous places in myself that I, man, I just started missing that right away. Wow, I can completely relate to that. Oh, and by the way, somebody just commented that they can't wait to read your book because they like feeling superior. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be the, the worst thing for your spirit, but the best thing for your ego that you've ever read. <laughs> Kirsten Minos, um, can't wait to read the book because I like feeling superior. Yep, it'll make you ultra spiritual, like so that you're more spiritual, so that you'll Thank attain you, spiritual superiority. <laughs> And um, I understand about the writing process, because, but also, do you find the writing process is therapeutic? It's healing? It kind of brings up stuff that you need to yeah. heal in, in a good way. It's cathartic. That's it. Cathartic. Very much so. And I've tried to put my finger 
on like why writing does that. Of course, conversation brings up, you know, different dimensions and you, you can't take the place of conversing with other people in your life, but there's something that writing does a, a place within us that we go when we write that we can excavate and mine that I don't know of any other way to do that. And it's a beautiful thing. And I think writing has been a, a very timeless artifact in human history, at least up until, I don't know how long people started writing ago, probably 1980 is when we discovered writing, but whatever, <laughs> whatever it was, yeah. there's a reason why writing has had such a profound place in human history because I think it brings something very, it's like a, a very new expression of something very ancient inside of us. And I think writing can really help unfold that. Yeah, I think so, because I actually encourage people to, to write, to journal. I mean, even if you're not going to be an author, just journaling is really, yeah. really helpful because it really digs up stuff. And, and my current book, the book I'm currently write, writing, is about, um, it's, it's about being sensitive. It's about being an empath, basically, and mm. feeling what other people feel and how it was always seen as a weakness. But yet, that's a, it's a gift. I mean, if we flip yeah. it around and see it as a gift, how, how different it is. But anyway, in exploring this and writing about it, I'm finding that it's it's very, very cathartic and there's so much that I'm digging and finding out more about myself. Um, yeah. And actually, as I'm speaking, somebody named Linda Deer has written, if you can't tell your story without crying, you haven't healed. And that mm -hmm. is so true because when I was writing my first book, Dying to Be Me, which was about the cancer, about the near-death experience, um, I cried as I wrote it. Mm. And so the, writing the book itself was a healing experience. And I love writing for that reason. I, man, I, that is beautiful. And as you mentioned that, there was, uh, yeah, my publisher, Sounds True, they put together a book called The Dharma of Dogs. And it's, it's a number of the Sounds True authors, myself, Eckhart Tolle, it is uh, just amazing people who are all dog lovers. So they asked us to each write, uh, I don't know what it was, several handful of pages about our relationship with our dog, just whatever it is. And, and, and that, that book came out last summer, but when I was sitting down to do the writing of it, like I felt blocked. It's like, all right, well, you know, the deadline's far away. That's fine. And it's not that long. Of, but I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And then it clicked, write it from Zephyr's perspective. So Zephyr is my beloved dog. He's Aww. turning 14 next month. And so when it just clicked, it's like, oh, yeah, let me write this from Zephyr's perspective. And as I was writing it, I was just bawling my eyes out. Aww. I just, I, Zephyr has been so healing to me. Uh, I mean, he's been my companion. It seems like since I was a kid. I mean, I got him when I was 23 and I'm 37 now. And looking back when I was 23, it's like, wow, I was like a kid back then. So Zephyr's, he's been like my shepherd this whole way. And, you know, as, as I was writing that and, or as Zephyr was writing it through me. He was me, channeling. Yeah, he was channeling oh, you. You yeah, were channeling that, him. Yeah. I, it is so touching and the tears were flowing. Then I sent it to my mom and she just starts crying because- <laughs> She loves Zephyr and I both like we're her sons. So, I mean, wise words, I think it was Linda whose comment was, if you can't cry about something when you're writing it, then you, you haven't, haven't really healed. Yeah. Such, 
It's such so wise true. words. It really wise words. And I love dogs too. And it's, uh, yeah, I can just imagine that if I was channeling my dog who has now gone to the rainbow bridge. Um, yeah. yeah, I would, I would cry too. And, um, Oh, and, and Safina Winfield has posted, that is my fear, losing my dog, Molly. I completely understand because we get so attached to, to our yeah. pets. We really do, our fluffy children. And JP, you said mm -hmm. that your dog is your mom's other son as well, right? Yes. Yeah. Is, is, your, is Zephyr her favorite son? Yeah, I honestly think so. I, <laughs> I know. She just loves that little guy. And Zephyr is the cuddliest dog I've ever met. And I mean, he just, he's got my mom wrapped around his little paws. They train us well, don't they? <laughs> they very much do. They train us so well that they even train us to think that we are their masters. That's how well they've got us trained. Oh. They are so smart. <laughs> oh, they're like, yeah, let's let these tall people think they're in control. Like that'll <laughs> that'll be a good way for us to keep control over them. <laughs> exactly. I think dog, the dogs kind of function like the Illuminati, but in a more <laughs> loving way. Yeah, they do, and they have ESP. I mean, they they know they are the Illuminati because they know we're coming even before we walk in the door, don't they? I mean, even That's when right. we're around the corner, they know that we're near. <laughs> We're solving the world's problems tonight. So the Illuminati dogs are the ones that run all the world's banks and currency, and they're the ones because, ushering in the new world order. Because they can read our minds, and without technology as well. Yeah. I mean, your now, dog can now, read your mind. Now I'm scared. I've got <laughs> Wally, one of our other dogs, sitting on the floor looking at me. I think he's plotting against me. But he knew I was going to say that. I see. <laughs> yeah, because he can read your mind. <laughs> oh, gosh. So so your book came out last year, right? And are you still? Yeah. And you're touring and stuff. Yep. March of 2017, it came out. So I don't know, about a year and a half ago at this point. And yeah, I went on you know, nice book tour, hit a, a number of cities and had a great time with great crowds that would show up. And and then now present day, I'm doing a, a, a lot of touring, doing live comedy shows, which is such a joy to do. Oh, I'm sure people would love to come and see you. And they can find out more about this on your website where you're appearing. Yeah, yeah, my my website awakenwithjp.com has all my tour dates and we're always adding new cities uh, to the the calendar. So, I'm having such a great time with and meeting such wonderful people. I know I love live events. It's a very different energy from doing online events. Um, I, I love, love, love live events. And so I, I always look forward to them because I love meeting the people and then you kind of just create this energy in the room. So I know exactly how yeah. you feel. It's, it's so enlivening and you, you hit the, the nail on the head. It's the energy in the room, you know, doing video work, online work. I love it. It's so purposeful and, and we got to keep doing that. And there's nothing that will ever take the place of live events. The energy, the surge, it's just, it, it's, yeah. it, it happens whenever, you know, two or more people are gathered, let yep. alone uh, a bunch of people. Especially when you're on the same wavelength and you feel that energy in the room, you know, because yeah. we're all connected. And, uh, and I'm going to turn to Danny and say, let's push up some comments. And uh, before we finish, let's push, push up some comments and questions up on the screen so, so everybody can see who's tuning in. Joanne, hey, I know you. Hi, Joanne. Love you guys. Love you right back, Joanne. See, we know Joanne. She's from Northern California. Right on. Thank you, Joanne. Nice to see you here. And Vicki Lyons, you should tour together and share the joy. Yay. Love it. I like it. Vicki, I like how you spell should. It's like you look at vowels when it comes to the word should and say, screw you, vowels. I'm going to save some time here. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That's a great idea. Rosa Cavaretta. 
pets teach us about grief and dying and they're fine with it. That's actually yeah. very true. They are fine with it. It's us who have trouble dealing with it. <laughs> we're, we're the ones that need help. But yeah, we, we definitely amazing. need help. <laughs> Please let this be the next conspiracy on YouTube, <laughs> Illuminati dogs. Yes. <laughs> I love that. That would be a fun one. That's a good video to create, the Illuminati dogs. <laughs> that, that, that's that's like a cross between the Illuminati and then the movie, the Reservoir Dogs. <laughs> you cross those together and we'd have the Illuminati a video dogs. at least three of us would watch. Who knows about it? <laughs> Yeah, at least three of us. <laughs> the best part about the Illuminati dogs, they wouldn't even need to gather together because they just telepathically communicate. Yeah, they're all plugged in when they're not too busy shape shape-shifting. They can pay attention to each other's ESP signals. Exactly. And <laughs> when they're not too busy manipulating us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do we have any questions or anyone with any burning questions? If there's anyone out there, um, last chance, few minutes, um, just if you have any questions for JP, for me, throw it out there. I know we have a ton of comments. I can see them. But until Danny uh, puts them on, sta on, on the uh, screen, what I can see are it's tiny, tiny, tiny little letters, tiny comments on his screen. So there's like a ton of them. Rajni Goyal, I'm not able to overcome my fears. Please throw some light. So what we were saying is that if you can play with your fears, um, do you have any words to add to that? Yeah, you know, I think sometimes when we're saying I need to overcome a fear, what we really mean is I want to bypass this fear. I want to get around it. I want to get past it now. But you know, it's like going through a dark forest on the hero's journey. The only way to the other side is through it. And I know nobody likes the journey when it comes to fear. We want to get to destination, overcome. Yep. So, you know, I, I think be, being kind to ourselves sometimes recognizes we need patience. We need time with fear. And it is not only okay, it's probably beneficial for me to be in the fear for as long as I need to be in it. Like there, fear to me, it's, it's analogous to like a, a sweat lodge. It feels like crap being in a sweat lodge. You, you think you're going to die. It's just really uncomfortable. But the sweat lodge helps metaphorically burn away who we're not. So the miracle of who we are can arise. And I think fear is the flame. Fear is part of our sweat lodge. So being in it, it's not comfortable, yet it can be very purifying. And I'm not talking about being a victim and just be complacent in our fear. It's like, no, you do the work, be connected, be vulnerable, do your self work and realize it's okay to be in it. You'll overcome it. Probably not based on your mind's calendar, but you'll overcome it when, um, when it's time, if that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense, actually. It's a lot of sense. It's about not denying the fear, not pushing yeah. it away, and embracing it. And the only way out of fear is through it. And yeah. You go through it and you come out the other side and it feels awful while you're going through it, but you do come out the other side. And I think the more that we avoid it, the more that we deny it, the more it becomes an issue. It becomes that elephant in the room and it never goes yeah. away. So yeah, that was a really, really good answer. Uh, well, thank you. Yep. Flowers grow best in mud and poop. <laughs> and we, you know, we all want the flowers with none of the mud, but, you know, let's get messy. It, it, it's necessary to have a good life. We got to get messy. I mean, we'll be love and light some of the time, wear our clean clothes and we'll feel put together some of the time. Yet we got to get messy in order to deal with the mud that's there when we don't have to create it. It's already there. You know, the fears find you. You don't have to go like, I need something to be afraid of. What's fine. It's there, but we, we need to acknowledge the mud in order to help our flowers blossom. We can't have the flowers without the mud. 
Yeah. And I wouldn't be here doing what I do today if I didn't go through the cancer and go through all yeah. the adverti adversity that I had to go through. That's a lot of mud. That's really a lot is. of mud. But today I get to sit here in my orange blouse and talk to you. <laughs> you, you clean up well, Anita. <laughs> For you. And Leslie Robin says, good metaphor with the sweat lodge. Yeah, absolutely. Great metaphor. So right on. Thank you for hearing that, Leslie. Yeah. So the the time has flown. Oh my gosh. Colleen per Perro, can I do the sweat lodge but still stay around passive aggressive people? What do you think about that one? Uh, that's a that's a good question. Uh, I, I I I would be uh, all I would say is be sensitive to the inner call. I mean, I don't think anybody could really truly give you your answer. I think sometimes the call is, okay, here's some passive aggressive people. I need to be around them because they are my mirror. Oh, and I hate that, but that's so true. And then other times, whether that goes on for a while or what, other times the call can be, all right, the right action is to assert boundaries and remove myself from yes. this energy, not not as uh, escaping it, but as uh, I've grown beyond this. So now the the authentic call is, is to leave the relationship. And other times the authentic call is stay in the relationship and know this person is mirroring for me, me. Yeah, yes. And the trick is to know which one it is, because um, if you are there because you feel that there's a reason, there's a purpose and you have to be there, then yes, yeah, stick it out. But if you are there because you are afraid to leave, you're afraid to displease people, people pleaser, all that, then it means that the braver thing to do would be to remove yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, in past relationships. I can relate to that. Yeah, I'm in this relationship because I'm afraid to leave. <laughs> it's, I mean, I've it's, spent it's very common. It's very common. I've spent years in relationships for that reason. I'm afraid to leave. And the best reason to leave is because we're afraid to leave. It's just, wow. Yes, that is the best reason to leave is because we're afraid to leave. I yeah. was in a relationship like that. I was engaged to somebody for months because I was afraid to leave. And thank you. Someone just wrote kisses to both of us. Yay. Oh, thank you. And uh, yeah, that's from Muriel Weibel Tashnes. Kisses from Switzerland to both of you. And thank you. Oh, we've got people from all over the world. We've got people from, um, from Australia, from Europe, from Asia, from all over the world. So good morning from the Netherlands, Belinda Frubel. So there you go. Yeah, wonderful. I, uh, hello, people of the world. Thank you for being on with us. Yeah. Yes, and so you you said you were in Texas, right? Right now. Yeah, I'm. Uh, my wife and I are in our new home in Austin, Texas. That's yeah. That's that's interesting. I um, I have been to Austin, Texas once for a very short time, so I didn't get a feel of it. I felt from all the places in the U.S. If I wasn't in California. My favorite place is Arizona. I just love the energy. Right? Yeah, I love Sedona and Arizona. I was going to ask. I'm not surprised that it's Sedona. That's one one place out of all the vortexes. I haven't been to Sedona. I I, I keep being told, JP, you got to go. It's oh. like, yeah, yeah, you're right. I do. I, I just don't know when I'll get there. But yeah, so it do. really calls you. Yeah, Sedona calls me. It really does. Arizona generally, it's that, mm -hmm. you know, it's that big sky and the and you've got like that Indian sun, that red sun, and the, yeah. it's it's just stunningly beautiful. I just love it, yeah. love it. So, um, so I'm gonna say thank you so much. This time has just passed so fast. You've been awesome, amazing. Mm -hmm. I know my audience loves you and we would love to have you on anytime you want. Well, thank you, Anita. I've 
absolutely loved being on here with you. I'd love to come back and uh, love having you as a friend in my life now. I, I, you're, you're just a treasure of a new friend uh, uh, that I get to have. So thank you for being you. Thank you for having me on, Anita. Oh, gosh, it's my pleasure. It's, in fact, um, uh, it, I, it, the pleasure is mine having you as a friend. Really, it is. And um, just, I just love you. I love you. I love your videos. I love how you shine the light of humor and just lighten everything up for everyone. So you're fabulous. And so everybody listening in, you know, you can get JP's book, um, which has half a step missing. I'm going to stick to that's my story and I'm sticking to it. And, uh, and you can check him out on his website, his social media. And, and maybe one day I'll pop in and see you live somewhere when you're performing. So I'd love that. Yeah. So thank you everyone. And you all know where to find me and I will see you all soon. I'll be doing another Facebook live on Sunday. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Thanks a lot. Have a great week and a great weekend. Bye.